hello to you all. Uh, this is Behind the Music. My name is Andrew Chung. I'm artistic producer of London Symphonia. And Behind the Music is a chance to speak to our, um, our guest artists, our special guests. But uh, in more ways than one, uh, Graham McKenzie is not a guest. He's one of our own. He's our principal oboist. Hello, Graham. Hi, Andrew. And hi, everybody watching. And we're, we're thrilled to have Graham performing Vaughn Williams' is, um, oboe concerto with us in the upcoming concert, A Necessary Lightness. So, uh, Graham, let's just dive right in. As an oboist, different from a violinist, um, you have a very soloistic role anyway in the orchestra. There's lots of solo moments, and when you're sitting in the chair as, as principal oboe, you have a certain mindset. And then for this piece, you step out of that zone, that zone of comfort, and you are put in the spotlight. How do you prepare for that? What's the mindset? What do you have to do to get ready for performing a concerto? You're ready for performing a concerto. It's a, it's a great question. And I, I find myself very fortunate that I have the opportunity to do that. Now, you are right that as principal oboist, I do get a lot of solo time in the orchestra. So at least it's not a jump from being in a section where I, you know, as a section violin player, you're just trying to fit right in and make the, the unified sound of your section. Now, and, and I have colleagues who have had to then make a jump to playing some solos and they've said it's quite a big jump psychologically. So for me, luckily it's not as big a jump, but you're standing, you're in front of the orchestra, all eyes are on you all the time. So I think the biggest jump for me in terms of preparing um, mentally is first of all, making sure that I know every inch of the score and I know exactly how I want the piece to go. I know how I want it to sound. It's just on another level from the orchestra because you're always leading. You're always leading. In orchestra, a lot of the job is you're accompanying other wind players and you're playing with the strings. You're kind of trying to fit into the ensemble. And in this case, you're just always the prominent musical voice. You're making the musical decisions. And also simply, it's kind of an, it's an attitude thing. It's a kind of it's, it's kind of like you open yourself up to the hall and you, you, you just, <laughs> I, I know I explain this very well, but you have to have this attitude that you're just always projecting into the hall and that all eyes are on you and everyone is hanging on the edge of every note. Mm. And you have to, even if that's not true, and I know there will be people in the audience who are falling asleep occasionally maybe, but I have to put yourself in that position and um, practice that. When I do run-throughs, for example, I imagine myself in the hall and imagine all eyes on me. Yeah. And I imagine that everyone's listening attentively every note, the whole orchestra, everyone in the hall. And putting myself in that mindset really makes me figure out, okay, do I sound exactly the way I want? Um, and what do I need to do so that when I go out on stage and this is how it feels that I'm just giving it exactly, I, I'm playing the piece exactly the way I want to. Yeah, you as a performer will sound quite different when you're imagining your sound going out to those ears, the person sitting in the front row, the person sitting in the back row. You will sound different. Whatever you do, it's probably, it's, you know, you wouldn't write down exactly what you do uh, um, in great detail. It's just that that imagination, that sense. Uh, you do produce sound differently when you're trying to communicate more powerfully, more directly, right? Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. And using the imagination is probably the most powerful tool, right? Because by the time we get together, you and the group, we're, we're, it's Friday, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the concert's Saturday. So all this work has to be done ahead of time. And it's a, it's a pretty fascinating uh, experience. And well, it's, it reminds me a lot of um, the Olympics. I was thinking about this as I was watching the athletes do their routines and they've been preparing for four years and then they have this one, you know, sometimes only a few seconds event to execute it perfectly. And there's so many parallels in performance uh, of music because we get the one concert to do this just exactly the way you want to. And so, um, in fact, this whole using the imagination idea 
and visualizing is a big part of uh, performance psychology. And it's something that was derived in a lot of ways originally from ath athletes because they've been having to do this for a long time as well. You very, very are, important. You, you are our musical Olympian and I'm, I'm <laughs> proud of that. It's awesome. <laughs> so let's go back to this piece and uh, around the time it was written, um, tell me a little bit about it. Well, it, it was written in 1944, so um, in the, right, right during the Second World War, and it was written during the Blitz, so there was a lot of bombing happening around Vaughan Williams, and in fact, um, the concerto was scheduled to be, had a premiere scheduled, which had to be cancelled because there was so much bombing in the area, it wasn't performed until later that year, so that I think is, uh, um, that I think is the main thing to think about in terms of just the timeline of it, what, and the setting in which he composed this piece. It was a time of devastation, of fear, of loss. I think that's a big mm. um, thing here. Um, it was actually composed at the suggestion of um, BBC management, interestingly. I couldn't find the details on exactly why that was, but it was, um, it, it was sort of suggested by them. Now, is it just a Vaughn Williams thing? Like, or did he compose this to kind of <clears throat> galvanize the public or make them reflective? Or did he, did he kind of articulate the reason for writing this concerto? No, he did not, unfortunately. Not, I, I've looked around for this. And interesting, Vaughn Williams is someone who, people, his music is so evocative and it seems like it tells us such a, such a strong story that a lot of people like to assign meaning to his music. And Vaughn Williams actually got quite frustrated about that. And he's quoted as saying, as saying, I suppose it never occurs to anyone that a man just wants to write a piece of music. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I, I find that very funny. Was, but I can also understand the frustration as an artist if you're trying to express certain emotions, certain sensations, certain feelings, certain stories in your life. And, but you don't want them, you don't want to literally attach a concrete story because that changes the experience for the listener. And so in this case, no, he did not. However, I think it's impossible for anyone listening to this piece to not hear nostalgia and longing and a sense of loss and a sense of tragedy. And also, by the way, a sense of hope. I mean, the piece ends on this beautiful held high note. It's very serene on a major chord. And it's very hard, I have to say, for me as a performer, and I think as the audience, once you know that it was composed during all this bombing and there was so much loss, it's, it's extremely hard to not believe that he was influenced by, and he wanted to express some of this longing for peace, the sadness, the devastation, but ultimately I think a sense of hope that it will all resolve in the end. And, you know, I guess it brings up the point that there's no right way to listen to music, right? I mean, we all come with our, uh, our own, you know, baggage, our histories, our, our, our interactions with music, our interactions with this peace, and that's all valid, it's all, it's all good. Right. And there's no right way to listen to this stuff. So Vaughn Williams, we think Vaughn Williams, in, you know, he has a very unique sound, a very unique voice. Um, you know, what did that come from? Well, it came from a couple. I think there are two main reasons why he has such a unique voice. Uh, the first is that he actively went and sought out folk music. He went and he toured around rural, um, rural England and he went to pubs, he went to farms, he went to ordinary people and collected folk songs basically. Uh, huge numbers of them, um, about eight, a bit over 800 was the figure that I was able to find roughly. Um, other composers did the same thing um, in other countries, but Von Williams to my knowledge is one of the few who went to such an extent to collect English folk songs. And he uses these folk songs in his pieces and the harmonies that would be evoked by them. So that's one thing that gives it a very distinct sound. Uh, the other thing is that he 
really want to avoid the influence of German romantic composers. This is the second thing. So Richard Wagner had been such a huge influence on music uh, in the a late um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A lot of people are very strongly influenced by him. Richard Strauss, who came later, um, he also was strongly influenced by Wagner. And so there are a lot of composers who are strongly influenced by this style of writing. And von Williams wanted to go against that. He didn't want to be influenced by that. He felt like so many other people were. So I think the combination of those two were the most important um, aspect of why he has such a unique voice, but also he was quite experimental. If you hear this piece, you don't hear it immediately. It sounds a nice kind of blend of actually kind of conservative and uh, experimental. But for example, he wrote a romance for harmonica and orchestra, which I think is amazing. Nobody else wrote wow. for that. And if you look at his symphonies, especially the later ones, there are many ways he uses instrumentation and just how he writes the music to um, to experiment with what was, what was possible. So I think all those things together were what resulted in his unique voice. And then he writes in modal scales too. Do you have like a one minute synopsis of, of, of what that actually means? Sure. So <laughs> what, we're, what we're used to hearing in most of the music that we listen to is just our standard, what we call diatonic scale. So this is the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do from the sound of music that major scale that we hear all the time, and then the minor scale, which is derived from that. But if you take a major scale and say you take those same exact notes and you start it on, say, the fourth note of a major scale. So instead of ba da di da di da di dum, you get da di da di da di da dum, which results in a slightly different sound. And I think as a listener, when I first heard this concerto, and I didn't know anything about modes versus scales, I knew it sounded different. And I thought there's something really interesting about the way the melody is written. It, it's a unique sound and it, it's different from what I used to, but I couldn't put my finger on it until I started really analyzing the piece. And I realized, oh, he's using all these modal scales. And so that definitely contributes to the unique sound as well. Very cool. So as an oboist, this is uh, one concerto amongst many. You guys, you know, you, you have a fair number of oboe concertos, but um, not quite as inexhaustible as the violins, but that's okay. We won't hold that against you. So what, <laughs> what does this particular oboe concerto or his writing for oboe um, challenges, joys? What, 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 what have you sensed when you've been preparing this? Right. So the joys of this to me is that Vaughn Williams is, in my opinion, he's a master of bringing out poignancy and the poignant quality of the oboe. He, the way he writes his melodies and the harmonies and the way he uses the instrument is just so incredibly evocative. It's so poignant. It's so powerful. And that to me is the biggest joy of this. And the reason, by the way, that I wanted to play this particular concerto, this was a request of mine. Um, in terms of oboistic stuff, uh, the biggest challenge for sure is endurance because it just, he creates these huge long phrases that are very atmospheric and sometimes they're very tranquil and very, very, very long and sustained to give this kind of feeling of floating, mm. right? This like huge wide open spaces. And, but to do that, of course, as a player, you have to sustain your sound with complete control and just manipulate it ever so slightly. And that, that takes a lot of endurance um, just with your air and your embouchure and also just mental endurance because there's, there aren't a lot of breaks in this concerto where you really get to take a few minutes, to, you know, a minute just to kind of recoup and recenter. Like you just kind of keep going and going and going. So that's a big challenge. Yeah. Um, but it actually is quite oboistic. I will say that um, this piece was written for Leon Goosens, who was known at the time as one of the very great oboists, certainly in England, if not the world. And Vaughn Williams actually sent him the part and said, you know, I would welcome any feedback from you that would 
make it more oboistic. Any changes you can suggest to the writing? And actually, Goosens didn't change anything. Oh. <laughs> of this whole 20 minute concerto, he didn't change anything. So I think that speaks to the fact that Vaughn Williams was a master orchestrator and you know, everything's in idiomatic ranges. There are very tricky parts finger wise, but they're not so hard that they can't be done well, right? So it actually is quite oboistic. Hmm. And then, and then the accompaniment for this is just strings. And I would presume that makes it easier for you. You don't have to compete with other winds and brass in the texture. That it, it does make it easier. And I think it's reflective of this kind of um, what Goosen's is always referred to as just English pastoral music, which this definitely fits into, which typically has kind of sort of more transparent tone colors mm. to evoke kind of this kind of peaceful, you know, it seems, it seems countryside scenes, right? It's very gentle, it's very kind of open. And if just having the string sound allows for more transparent colors, it also allows for softer dynamics. Mm -hmm. And this piece is full of like piano, pianissimo dynamics. I mean, it also has some big moments, of course, but there's a lot of this kind of very, these intimate colors and having just the strings as the accompaniment allows for that to be done more effectively, for sure. I can't wait to perform this work with you, Graham. Thanks so much for joining me today. Of course, and thank you for <laughs> thank you for agreeing to pro pro uh, to uh, pro program this specific piece. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I I just hope the audience will love it as much as as I do. <laughs> oh, I I know they will. Thanks again, Graham. You're welcome. Thanks, Andrew. And now I welcome our special guest conductor, Evan Mitchell. Hey, Evan. Hi there. It's great you could join me today. Um, so I'll just read a little bit about Evan. Uh, so Evan Mitchell is proving to be one of the most able and imaginative conductors in Canada. Um, Evan has enjoyed seven triumphant seasons as music director of the Kingston Symphony, garnering praise for his programming approach and musical results. Over the course of his career, he has also brought the magic of orchestral music to over 750,000 students and children, many of whom have never experienced a live performance firsthand. His programs for young people have been recognized for their appeal and educational mandate. So this is great. Is this, is this the first time that you're conducting then in London? Uh, yes, it absolutely is. Uh, I used to, uh, uh, way, way back, uh, perform every so often as an extra percussionist uh, in, uh, with Orchestra London. Um, this was before I went out to Vancouver as assistant conductor there. So I've certainly, I've never conducted uh, Orchestra London. I've definitely never conducted London Symphony. I'm looking forward to it very much. As we are too, this is great. great. So um, uh, Graham uh, McKenzie spoke a lot about the, the Vaughn Williams uh, oboe concerto. I was just wondering if I could get your thoughts about the other two works in the program. So first of all, we've got Strum. Um, this is by Jesse Montgomery. Have you come across this piece before or any of other uh, Miss Montgomery's works? It's interesting. I've never actually come across this piece and it's, it's a very popular piece as it turns out. Um, my first exposure to Jesse Montgomery was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic thereabouts, or maybe a few months in, uh, the National Arts Center Orchestra uh, performed a piece of hers on one of their concerts on their their, uh, their glorious live streams. Uh, this was, uh, the piece was called Star Starburst, I think. Yeah, Starburst, Starburst on that. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I thought like, boy, that's, that's a really, uh, quite an innovative and colorful piece. And so then whenever that happens, I have a tendency to just like, what else have they written? And so I went through a lot of her catalog there and I thought Jesus is a, a really great composer. So when, when this uh, showed up on this particular uh, program, uh, when I was sent the details, of course, I was just absolutely delighted. Great. Now, uh, being a violinist, I think of pizzicato, you know, classical term for the thing. And then this piece is called strum. So what are people going to hear? Well, uh, there's certainly an awful lot of pizzicato in, in the piece, uh, but you could actually get away with calling it strum, uh, strumming, uh, as, even as a violinist, because there is a, the, the direction here and there to sort of hold the, the violin guitar style. And then she actually writes up bow and down bow markings, which you would normally associate with, with bow direction. Uh, but that's actually the direction in which you, you rake your finger across the strings. So it becomes very much uh, 
this sort of like a, I mean, maybe more like a mandolin, let's say, than than, than a guitar. But like a, there's a very um, a very characteristic sound that comes from that that really f forms the the heart of the piece. It's again like seemingly all of her other works is very colorful this one is particularly driven rhythmically but the idea of that strumming gesture is something that, that pervades uh most of the piece and so that's what you'll you'll expect to see sort of some unconventional technique and then uh, when i when i do this strumming pattern you know i i immediately i think and maybe that's her sound world i think uh, folk music i think of this east coast appalachian kind of sound uh, what is that? How can how do we describe that to people? Well, it, it's sort of a, it's it's one of those things where uh, it, it's kind of hard to describe, but you'll know it when you hear it. Um, she makes a, a point of mentioning in her program notes, uh, speaking about American folk idioms uh, and uh, the spirit of the dance, and uh, those those are, are pretty obvious. But um, there are, are certain things that she employs a lot of uh, a, a lot of perfect um, intervals, perfect fourths, and perfect fifths, rather than. Uh, conventional harmony and that that leads to an awful lot of warmth uh in the sound and that's very evocative um i would say that like just again using using the strings in this manner with all of this strumming and all this plucking you do sort of get a sense of that's that's quasi guitar to, to a degree um and she uses some scale uh some scales that are quite often used uh, associated with with folk music, uh, uh, the Dorian mode, the Mixolydian mode, where you just you basically you don't have uh, particularly this not to geek out too much about about harmony and these sorts of things, but you don't have a raised seventh degree, which never which means that you never really feel as though you have the push and the pull of a standard phrase, and that leads to really long sections, uh, and I mean this in the best sense. Uh, where it just feels like the music flows. And that's obviously an important characteristic of, of successful uh, folk music. Yeah, it's got a terrific flow, doesn't it? It's a little bit irresistible, this piece. Can't yeah. wait. Can't wait. So let's turn to Beethoven a little bit. And, and uh, so we've called this concert a necessary lightness. You wouldn't want to say that six times in a row, but anyway. Uh -huh. and, and you, so you didn't choose this title, but what do you take from this, this, uh, this and what it means for Beethoven's fourth? Um, well, um, specific to the program, I think we can only use a little bit of lightness right now, don't you? <laughs> it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> uh, it's it's a it's a very tricky time, and you know um, the one of the the delights of the point in which we're at right now is that we are currently in a position where we're all very grateful to be able to perform, and that I think will will bring a lightness of spirit to everything, of mm -hmm. course. Um, with regard specifically to Beethoven, so. Um, Beethoven's Fourth Symphony is tucked in between two gargantuan, um, groundbreaking moments in music history, literally two watershed symphonies. And I, um, Schumann had a quote about it that I'm sure I'm going to butcher right here, but he essentially likened the Fourth Symphony to a slender Greek maiden uh, in between two Norse giants. <laughs> and Beethoven had this, uh, he had a bit of a pattern of taking the, uh, eventually, of taking the even numbered symphonies and generally speaking, them having them be lighter affairs and saving the uh, the odd numbered symphonies for like the more uh, iconic, the more epic stuff. It's basically the inverse of the Star Trek films of the classic Star Trek films, <laughs> if you happen to be a Star Trek guy. Um, so uh, the, the third symphony, obviously, is one of these moments that, that almost you could argue was the beginning of, of true romanticism in music. The fifth symphony, um, one of the great innovations uh, in the repertoire, and then you have the fourth in between, which really looks inward. Uh, it's a little bit more classical and backward thinking in certain elements. Um, for all of its boisterous nature, um, there's also a, a, a lot of contemplative, intimate music, um, which you don't find in, in the Eroica. You don't find that in the fifth symphony. And uh, it really is overall, I think, uh, light, even in its most frenetic, frantic moments. Um, so I couldn't think of a more appropriate piece to be on a program entitled "Unnecessarily Lightness." Perfect. Now, if uh, if our if if you were to give a couple of things for our audience to listen out for um, mm -hmm. in this symphony, what uh, what would they be? Would it, maybe one per movement or something like that. Okay, so uh, let's see. So in the first movement, uh, it begins actually in, in a very mysterious manner. And I think this is one of Beethoven's great slow introductions because it's such a curveball. It leads into uh, 
a, a joyous first movement proper, but it begins in a manner that's almost like like a pipe organ playing a bit of a dirge. Yeah. And so uh, it's quite a misdirect. I love it very much. It's one of one of my favorite Beethoven of Beethoven's uh, symphonic gestures. Uh, the second movement is uh, uh, Beethoven always writes really wonderful slow movements. There is an absolutely aching feature for the clarinet in the slow movement that I think uh, it's impossible to miss. It goes on for a, a quite a period of time, and uh, it's it's just going to take your breath away, I think. So that's a highlight of the second movement for me. Uh, the third movement is a classic Beethoven scherzo, so you'll just get this great sense of, uh, of weird shifts in dynamic and um, going from great bravura to you know mysterious uh, sections uh, at the blink of an eye. Um, the beat gets displaced. Scherzos are uh, such, they have a flavor all of their own. And this is a, such a perfect example of a Beethoven scherzo. So just the, the very execution of the third movement, I think is a highlight. And the finale is uh, a no holds barred, a uh, relentless flurry of, uh, of very fast notes. I think the thing to listen for there in the recapitulation is a glorious solo for the bassoon. There's a, a moment in which the bassoon gets to take uh, this, this crazy, melody for just a couple of bars and it's always a joy to hear so those that's that's one per movement thank you evan great speaking with you looking forward to performing this program with you this week oh uh, as am i fantastic so this is a necessary lightness and our concert is going to be performed in person uh to an in-person audience and live streamed march 19th at 7 30 p.m uh, live from Metropolitan United Church. Thanks again, Evan. Thank you very much.